It's Sunday, August 6, 2023. I'm Anthony Davis. Welcome to The Weekend Show, where we take a deep dive into the news of the week. You can support my work and independent journalism at patreon.com slash five minute news. Our guest today is an American historian and cultural critic. She is a scholar on fascism and authoritarian leaders and a professor of history. She's author of five books, including Strong Men from Mussolini to the Present. She also writes a regular Substack newsletter entitled Lucid. Ruth Ben Gatt, welcome back to the weekend show. Thank you. I'm pleased to be here. Now, it's been a very interesting week. Donald Trump pleading not guilty to charges that he orchestrated the plot to overturn the election. Um, the indictment, 45 pages, compelling. Jack Smith sitting there looking at him and he glanced back. I mean, this is surreal. And for somebody like you who has studied Donald Trump and writes about authoritarian leaders, I mean, what was the mood like in your house? Was was it celebratory? Yeah, I, I think it's it's it's. Ex I was very moved in that um, this wouldn't be happening in many countries around the world because it can't happen if you don't have a democracy. So that's <laughs> that's the fundamental thing. I also thought it was very interesting uh, that the indictment talked so much about uh, his propagandizing, the lies he spread. And I had actually just published uh, a piece in my Substack about how I think he, we underrate him as a propagandist and, and how effective he's actually been at that. Um, so, so those were, uh, you know, some of the initial reactions I had. So Donald Trump uh, pleaded not guilty on Thursday to charges that he orchestrated a plot to try to overturn his 2020 election loss in what U.S. prosecutors call an unprecedented effort by the then president to undermine the pillars of American democracy. Uh, the indictment is 45 pages long. Uh, Jack Smith accused Trump and his allies of promoting false claims the election was rigged, pressuring state and federal officials to alter the results and assembling fake slates of electors to try to wrest electoral votes from Joe Biden. Um, the the scenes very typically uh, on Thursday were, you know, the news media were filming his Trump jet flying in. They kind of over dramatized it. They love to kind of they can't let go of the fact that he's like a superstar and, and his box office that I find that personally very frustrating because to me, he's a he's a, a criminal and a fascist. And yet, why doesn't America kind of still celebrate him despite knowing that, you know, these crimes are so clear, there's so much evidence against him. What is it about the American psyche that it seems to, you know, ambulance chase Donald Trump wherever he goes? Yeah, I don't know if it's always celebrating him, but it's paying him so much attention that it feeds into his kind of personality cult. And it's interesting that, you know, he, he was in New Jersey, he wasn't anywhere near Washington, and he could have uh, just uh, phoned it in on Zoom. That was an option for him. But of course, there's no spectacle of victimhood. And uh, if you do that, and there's two things. Donald Trump is extremely savvy at exploiting moments of spectacle. He's a media guy. So there's both the, the victimhood, but he also has to seem like the president for the millions of deluded followers who still see him as the president. And that that's a prime if you think like he does, that's a prime occasion to renew the spectacle of this presidentialism, let's call it. So, you know, that's why his jet is called Trump Force One, because mm -hmm. it's Air Force One for the actual president. And then he has his motorcade. Um, so, of course, he's not going to be on Zoom. He would have missed all that. I wonder how much of that motorcade, you know, how many of the vehicles are paid for by the, you know, the, the federal budget, because they're supposed to, and how many of those vehicles are like extra Trump paid for vehicles just to build up that kind of dramatic aspect and, and, and the theater of him being a president? Yeah, I don't know, but he's entitled, you know, for the rest of his life, like all past presidents, to Secret Service protection. But the jet is, he uses the jet in uh, very interesting ways. Um, when he started his campaign, uh, he kicked it off very symbolically in Waco, Texas, which he chose because it's a site, a pilgrimage site of 
you know, white extremism, anti-government extremism. And what he did, he, he came in, he had it on an airfield, near an airfield, and he flew in with Trump Force One. And, it, and the whole staging of it, I wrote a, a lucid column for this too. It reminded me of Triumph of the Will, where Hitler comes down from the skies in the airplane. Uh, that's Lenny Riefenstahl's film about the Nuremberg rally. And, and it was very carefully staged, Trump's Waco rally. So he, he uses the jet. He, yes, he can get Secret Service protection, but, but he uses all the other trappings of his personality cult and his status as a billionaire um, to convince people that he's competent, he's successful, and that he's still their president. I was very interested in what he said. He made a brief statement, didn't he? So, you know, he flew, he flew from Bedminster, his golf club, very short flight, and to, to D.C. He shouldn't really have gone in an aeroplane at all. He's not great for the planet, but anyway, you know, and so, as you say, it's all, it's all for theatre. And then he went in a vehicle on the interstate, I think it was 395, where you can't really see anything. It's, it's like walled and it's tunnelled, and then there's like three blocks before you get to the courthouse, he does his courthouse thing, which, of course, we're not privy to, although the sketches that I've seen by the, by the court sketch artist have been really kind of interesting. And when he reverses that journey and comes back, he gets out, the, out of his car before he's getting into the plane, and he makes a short statement. And the first thing he describes is the state of D.C. He says it, it's crumbling, there's graffiti, the walls are falling down, and this is not how I left it, trying to kind of say that Joe Biden can't, do kind of basic, you know, civic work. Just tell us what you thought of that statement that he made. And why did he talk about that first? Because the, there's a couple of end games that the Republicans have. One is the, the most consequential. They are all hands on deck um, to prove that democracy doesn't work, that Biden, who, because he's the one there, if it weren't him, it'd be somebody else, but that Biden is incompetent that only Trump can have infrastructure weak and make everything beautiful and golden and combat crime. And so they, they plus their allies at Fox and all the other you know, right-wing media, they're constantly giving people uh, this discourse of the urban centers are full of you know, crime, they're falling apart, they're dangerous. And this is not new. Trump, Trump used these images when he did his inauguration speech in 2017. And it, and it was so apocalyptic what he said back then that famously George, uh, George Bush was sitting in the front row with Michelle Obama and he leaned to her and he said, it's his language, excuse me, he said, that's some weird shit about the inauguration speech because Trump was depicting this, this you know, terrible uh, wreck of a nation and he said the American dream is dead. So that's what he's trying to do um, to scare people who don't go to Washington and they can't know that it's fake. Um, yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? Because, I mean, look, find me a metropolis that doesn't have graffiti. I mean, that's the first thing, right? This is, you know, c cities have all sorts of people in. But it's just weird that, you know, maybe it's diversion technique, isn't it? Because he doesn't yes. want to talk about what actually happened because it's embarrassing. And and from what I've read about what took place in the court, the judge made him wait 15 minutes before the judge showed up. So he was having to hang around a bit. And, you know, I would I'd like to hope that the judge knew exactly what they were doing when they did that. Uh, Jack Smith was seated there and apparently they exchanged a glance, which is which is again is, you know, something that I, I would you mentioned Nuremberg. I mean, just, you know, watching the Nuremberg trials, that's kind of what made me think of this you know, situation this kind of pressure cooker environment on the defendant. Yeah, this was a profound humiliation for him. So, uh, and nobody, of course, is going to say that in the GOP. And, and so he has to turn it around and just talk about how competent and indispensable he is instead. Yeah. Um, that's, that's, the, that's, how, that's what they do in such situations. If in doubt, mention the graffiti. Always, <laughs> always brings up some emotion in somebody. But then he went on to talk about political persecution. And I thought this was interesting because uh, only on uh, Friday, I think it was, it was announced that uh, in the Kremlin, Alexei Navalny, who of course is the political opponent of, of Vladimir Putin, 
his uh, sentence was extended by 19 years um, and sentenced to a special regime with the harshest prison conditions in the country. I mean, this is a guy who was a, a political opponent, briefly a political opponent of Putin, who they s slung into prison under without really without any reason and and Trump is comparing himself effectively to Navalny but it's completely different isn't it yeah this is a worrisome um political discourse and again it's not just Trump it's backed up by all right-wing media and GOP lawmakers each of them have a lot of influence they're the elite that um that democracy is tyranny that the real danger of authoritarianism comes from the left, and that the Biden, as Marjorie Taylor Greene puts it, it's the Biden regime. <clears throat> and so this, this is a background discourse. And then January 6th becomes an act of patriotism, and those who are sitting in jail because they were you know, attacking policemen and trying to you know, over, overturn democracy, they become political prisoners. And Trump is the biggest uh, persecuted person of all. And now that also, so that's, that's part of this um, turning people away from democracy, making them fear that they're going to be next. And he, so that's why he's also saying, I'm the victim, but I'm just in the way they really want you. They're going to come after you next. So if you don't save me, it's going to be, you know, you who might go to jail. And, and that's, that's very worrying because that's how you get people to be so afraid that they will, you know, commit violence or they will do whatever they feel existentially threatened. Let me just uh, read a couple of Trump's uh, Truth Social posts in the, in the last few days. Um, he said uh, on Thursday, he posted, Biden and his family steal millions and millions of dollars, including bribes from foreign countries, and I'm headed to D.C. to be arrested for protesting a crooked election, unfair venue, unfair judge. We are a nation in decline. MAGA. Um, he's, he's not the most eloquent creature, is he? I, I, I mean, the, all of this projection, so many of the things that he refers to, you know, Biden crime family, well, that's been proven not to be true. There, is, there are no crimes in the Biden family. Uh, quite the opposite. You know, Biden's been a lifelong public servant and it was such as unfortunate that his son was, was a drug addict. But ultimately, cr Trump crime family actually does fit because, mm -hmm. you know, of all of these crimes, including at the Trump organization that we uh, have heard about. So just talk to me a, bit, a little bit about the, the projection and, and, and just switching everything, because we could find out what Trump's true crimes are just by reading his own posts, but, but changing the person. Yeah, project, you know, this is this is the classic. Mussolini d did this, uh, as did the early communists and, and later communists and later fascists. And it's the reason it's very effective is that um, every successful authoritarian are really good sloganeers. They have slogans. And Trump is a marketer and he's extremely skilled as a propagandist. He knows how to have catchy phrases. So Biden crime family. Um, you know, all the things, drain the swamp, which, you know, Mussolini had, was the first person to say drain the swamp um, for the same reasons. And then Bolsonaro. So they all use these slogans that are projection, but it works with people because it, it becomes part of a, a kind of seamless universe of propaganda and infused with conspiracy theories so, so that um, they are the... They are the truth tellers. They are the ones risking their lives to stop the corruption. And, and in this case, um, now Trump doesn't invent all these things, nor do most strongmen. We, the, the whole thing about the deep state and the corruption of the institutions, that was inherited from the Tea Party and other kind of fringe Republican. But Trump, he kind of capitalized on it and he personalized it, that it's all about him now that because he's the biggest victim, the, the deep state is against him. And that's why he says very uh, ominously, if I come back, we're going to destroy the deep state. Um, 
It's almost like the, the deep state, I mean, which is basically the federal government. He wants to dismantle the federal government, including the Justice Department. And anything, any department, an individual that has wronged him, he will seek retribution, which is why another Trump presidency would be way worse than what we saw Maybe. last time, undoubtedly. Another of the, his posts uh, on, Friday, uh, on Thursday, he said, I'm now going to Washington, D.C. to be arrested for having challenged a corrupt, rigged and stolen election. It is a great honor because I am being arrested for you. Make America great again. Let, let's, you mentioned it, but let's talk a bit more about this idea that he's carrying the, the can. You know, he's basically put the crime onto his supporters. They're paying his legal bills, as we just discovered, to the tune of $40 million. And yet... It's it's a weird grift to play, isn't it? Because it doesn't really make any sense if you if you were to analyze it. You know why he's doing the he's doing the time, yet they did the crime. I mean, what does he really mean? <laughs> yeah, he's doing the time. They did the crime. Um, well, first of all, it's not original. Um, Berlusconi in Italy, who when he um, when he was forced out uh, by the eurozone crisis, he had twenty seven indictments over him and he never went to jail. And he used to say he was the Jesus Christ of Italian politics because he was the savior, of course, but he was the martyr because he was taking the hits for them. Yeah. Um, so they, they all do this. Um, but the reason it's, it works is that, and the reason he does it is that, okay, after a while, you know, he's been doing this victimhood thing for a long time. Now, He's getting, you know, not just impeachments, which are already very serious, <laughs> and investigations, but he's also got these indictments. And it might be easy to think, well, some people are going to think he's just got too much baggage and they get tired of it. It's too much chaos, too much of a circus. And there are Republicans or independents who are, get sick of him. So he has to up the ante. And the way you do that is by making these people feel that they are personally threatened. So it's not just that he's the victim, because they could say, fine, I'm sick of him, let him be the victim. I'll go for Ron DeSantis or whoever. He, he's got to tell them to keep the bond, keep them tethered to him and loyal. He's got to make them feel that he stands between them and the apocalypse. And so he's taking the hit for them. And that's why it's 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 imperative that they vote him back into the White House so we can take care of this once and for all and protect them. It's so interesting to me because, you know, I've been saying quite a lot recently that Trump's presidency didn't benefit any of his supporters to, to any tune whatsoever. You know, there was this $1,000 check, this kind of rebate, tax rebate, which happened early on with the, with the Trump signature on the check, which was like a stunt to bribe people into thinking that they would be, you know, winning like lottery money while while he was the president. But other than that, what I've really come to the conclusion is that it just gave people license to be a bit racist, you know, just to know that, well, if the president is is as rude and aggressive and abusive and goes to police events and tells police, don't worry about them hitting their heads when they get in the back of the car. You know, do you remember that one? That was you know, quite frightening. But that was a dog whistle to the police, that brutality was acceptable. I mean, these people, it's a bit like turkeys voting for Thanksgiving, isn't it? When they, when they are, they're basically trying to bring back a guy who has, doesn't serve them. The tax breaks are for the top 1%. The brainwashing is so much so that they really have been used. And mm -hmm. I'm just hoping that there's going to come a moment where they might realize that. Do you think this event, this arrest, this arraignment, this this court case, upcoming court case, might be the thing that makes people realize that they've been sold a lie? Um, probably not, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Because... It's always bad news. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> because... Um, he's again as a propagandist he set up this narrative groove so that yeah. everything that happens fits into it and the bigger the bigger the stakes the more he is persecuted and so you're going to see and again it's not just him it's all of his enablers 
uh, who have a lot of power, the senators, all kind, the most important people in the nation, supposedly, are going to be backing him up on all of this. Um, and in general, uh, it takes, you know, th this is the sad, you put your finger on the saddest thing about authoritarians. They have a use and discard philosophy with their followers. And that's not, not just the, um, the, the kind of masses who go to the, the rallies. Um, and remember the older people, uh, we discovered that most of his, um, most of his kind of contributions now are coming from retired people. And they're not remembering that, you know, during the last campaign cycle, uh, he, they, there were these famous incidents where he had uh, rallies uh, at night and he left, he left these elderly people out in the cold uh, in the Midwest and he, they didn't care if what happened to them. They didn't arrange for any transport. So they're literally leaving them stranded. But every authoritarian uses people to get to power, important people, and then throws them under the bus. And they, they couldn't care less about their followers. Indeed, they despise, some of them despise their followers. They, they see them as dupes. And that's where early on Trump had said, I, I could run as a Democrat, but Republicans are more stupid. That's a misquote, but that's, that's what he'd said, that he, it was better for him to run as a Republican because they were more stupid and they would believe his lies, basically. There's a there's a video that I uh, saw a couple of weeks ago of him on his way to a radio interview, but he's like backstage at one of his rally um, event spaces, and there's he's walking through with his security detail, and there's a whole bunch of his supporters like waiting back there to kind of meet him, and he does this kind of thing with his arm that suggests he wants the, this great unwashed moved aside he doesn't want to get near these people and then he like stands back and he's like oh my god like i'm actually coming up close i mean he never goes he never goes near his base i mean these no. are the last people that he would ever want to engage with well this is why and i i talk about this in strongman too they not only they they in the in the endings chapter that they despise the people who love them but they also construct, um, they stay as far away as they can. So they construct these bunkers, you know, Mar-a-Lago is Trump's equivalent, palaces, compounds, because they're afraid of people too. They're afraid of them. They're afraid they're going to turn on him if they discover that he's lying to them or he's, you know, ripping them off. Um, I, I always think of uh, Representative Zoe Lofgren, who uh, was on the January 6th committee, and she said the big lie was the big ripoff. And that Trump was sending the last um, fundraising uh, email came out like an hour before the violence started on yeah. January 6th for that season, that yeah. cycle of fundraising. And, um, and he's, he's got, you know, the, he's got his followers paying legal expenses. For a while, he also had the Republican National Convention paying his personal legal expenses. So all of this is just a giant machine uh, to make his life easier. Um, and that's what, that's what this genre of um, authoritarians do. They arrange everything, eventually institutions, so that it solves their personal problems. The, on Thursday, the moment that he was arraigned, a, a message went out, text message went out, to emails to all his supporters with a photo of him looking like, you know, he's imprisoned and with a slogan saying, donate now, you know, like a get out of jail card, donate mm -hmm. now. And it was, it was immediate. I mean, you know, the, the, as you said, the machine is there. And in fact, they probably, as you said, in, enjoyed this whole theater of the arrest because it represents several million dollars to them in revenue. Oh, totally, totally. And, and this is why I, people don't, they don't like to hear this because they, Psychologically, he's so upsetting because truly there's never been anyone like Trump in the, in the White House, either a Republican or a Democrat. He transcends political parties. He's so criminal in so many areas. Really, there isn't any area of his personal or political or business life where he hasn't committed crimes. So people don't know really what to do with this. And so it's easier to say, oh, he's just a clown. Um, 
we don't have to take him seriously. And so when I say that, I think he's um, one of the most important propagandists of the early 21st century. People think I'm crazy, but consider this, that I don't know of another instance where somebody in a democracy with a very open media environment was able to pull off a mass deception on this scale. He convinced, I don't know the exact number, is it 50 million, is it 40, is it 60 million, but a lot of people, again, in a democracy with lots of choice of what they read and watch, he convinced them that they shouldn't believe their own eyes and ears and they should think that he won the election. I don't know of anyone else who's done that. Now, even Berlusconi, who had a cult and did many of the same things, he owned all the private TV networks in Italy. And of course, he gave them to his kids as a kind of, you know, like it, it, he still controlled them. But so Berlusconi had enormous, and he owned all the TV advertising. <laughs> now, Trump didn't even have that. And yet, He's such a good propaganda, such a good sloganeer, and he had help, but so did Berlusconi. So he's not to be underestimated in any way. We have to take a, a quick break uh, for our sponsor, but I, I want to come back and talk about fascism and how we connect the kind of historical fascism to the kind of fascism that Donald Trump represents here on The Weekend Show. Did you know that your temperature at night can have one of the greatest impacts on your sleep quality? If you wake up too hot or too cold, I highly recommend you check out Miracle Maid's bed sheets. Inspired by NASA, Miracle Maid uses silver infused fabrics and makes temperature regulating bedding, so you can sleep at the perfect temperature all night long. Using silver infused fabrics originally inspired by NASA, Miracle Made sheets are thermoregulating and designed to keep you at the perfect temperature all night long, so you get a better sleep every night. These sheets are infused with silver that prevent up to 99.7% of bacterial growth, leaving them to stay cleaner and fresh three times longer than other sheets. No more gross odors. Miracle sheets are luxuriously comfortable without the high price tag of other luxury brands and feel as nice, if not nicer, than bed sheets used by some five star hotels. Stop sleeping on bacteria. Bacteria can clog your pores, causing breakouts and acne. Sleep clean with Miracle. Go to trymiracle.com slash weekend to try Miracle Made Sheets today. And whether you're buying them for yourself or as a gift for a loved one, if you order today, you can save over 40%. And if you use our promo code WEEKEND at checkout, you'll get three free towels and save an extra 20%. Miracle is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you aren't 100% satisfied, you'll get a full refund. Upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com slash weekend and use the code weekend to claim your free three-piece towel set and save over 40% off. That's trymiracle.com slash weekend to treat yourself. Thank you, Miracle Made, for sponsoring this episode. This summer, you could spend thousands of dollars on planes, hotels and tourist traps, or you could spend less money on a beautiful garden that will give you years of pleasure with FastGrowingTrees.com. FastGrowingTrees.com has thousands of easy-to-grow plant, shrub and tree varieties expertly curated for your unique climate and needs. From mayor lemons to evergreens to shade trees and everything in between. No more waiting in long lines and hauling heavy plants around. With FastGrowingTrees.com you order online and your plants arrive at your door in just a few days. No green thumb? No problem. Fast Growing Trees plant experts are just a Zoom, chat or phone call away. Always available and always eager to help. They can even walk you through your entire garden to help solve problems you're having with plants and trees. Plus, Fast Growing Trees plant experts have specialised degrees and training to help troubleshoot from root to leaf. It's like telehealth for your plants. I personally love FastGrowingTrees.com because they had the Mayer lemon tree that I was looking for that I didn't think I could get in California, and they helped me, they sent it, and now the plant is thriving. And they can help you too. And with Fast Growing Trees, they have a 30-day Alive and Thrive guarantee. 
you know, everything will look great, fresh, out of the box. Join almost 2 million happy Fast Growing Trees customers. Go to fastgrowingtrees.com slash weekend now to get 15% off your entire order. That's 15% off at fastgrowingtrees.com slash weekend. We're back with Ruth ben Gatt here on The Weekend Show. Um, the fascism word gets kind of banded about a lot, even from the right throwing it at the left and, you know, the right calling Joe Biden a fascist and Trump calling Joe Biden a fascist. Now, we've, we've talked about projection, but, you know, actual fascism, it, it always reminds me of that um, uh, flyer that was created. I think it was created by, uh, in India, maybe, that was the early warning signs of fascism. And it's been reproduced multiple times. And when you look at the things on that list, you can basically check everything that Donald Trump represents. Powerful and continuing nationalism, disdain for human rights, identification of enemies as a unifying cause, supremacy of the military, which of course he loved, rampant sexism, well that's a whole chapter, controlled mass media, obsession with national security, religion and government intertwined, as we've seen, this kind of breakdown of the separation of church and state, um, corporate power protected, labor power suppressed, disdain for, intellect, disdain for intellectuals and the arts, obsession with crime and punishment, rampant cronyism and corruption, and finally fraudulent elections, which is the one that he's up in front of the judge for. Um, I mean, I c can't really believe, because I moved to the U.S. In, for two weeks of Obama just before Trump's inauguration, so I planned to live in this very forward-thinking, free country. And two weeks later, I basically got all of those things on that list. I mean, how how much of it is Donald Trump wanting to rep replicate fascist leaders of history versus it just coming from the, dirty, the dir dirtiest and darkest place within him? He's not, I don't think he's wanting to replicate historical fascism because he just wants um, as much power as he can get. And, and he is like all strong men, he's transactional. He doesn't actually care about light, uh, right versus left. And in fact, if you see who he keeps praising, um, right now it's you know, the heads of you know, Putin, head of North Korea, uh, China, so it's like fascist, communist, you know, it doesn't matter to him. What matters is the degree of power that they have. And when he praises the Chinese, uh, you know, justice system where they he said, oh, they can just execute somebody like in a few hours. It's all done. There's no paperwork. That's what he wants. Yeah. So he's 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 not schooled, although I believe his wife, Ivana, his first wife, and she said he had two books in his bedroom in the old days. And one was his own, like, Art of the Deal. And the other was a book of Hitler's speeches. And I think when he was younger, I, I, that doesn't surprise me. But, he, but they're all like this. It's not that. They, they watch what each other does. So, you know, Xi Jinping's been watching Putin, what Putin gets away with, um, very carefully as he thinks about Taiwan. Um, they all watch what each other gets away with and what they get punished for. Um, but Donald Trump is instinctive. And the main, the main character he has that they all have is he knows when to exploit opportunities and he knows how to convince people of his lies and he knows how to intimidate people. Because, and that latter one is very important for the GOP because the GOP, they all, the, those lawmakers, they know he's lying. Um, but they've signed on for all of his program. Um, and that's because they either are true believers in him or they have been convinced or they've been threatened. You know, there's different cases. But as a whole, they have signed on to become his autocratic party. And that's, that's the biggest story uh, along with what he has done, that the GOP is now an autocratic party inside a democracy. That's our drama now. That's one of the great mysteries to me is that, you know, all of these people who sit in Congress and in the Senate on the Republican side and governors and mayors, I mean, it extends throughout the country, but their silence is, is very telling, isn't it? Because 
they're having to sacrifice a lot. You know, their own lives will suffer because of Donald Trump's premiership. And 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 yet, is it like the is it either the compromat that he has on these individuals, or the fact that he likes to publicly shame people who don't support him a hundred percent and give that loyalty that he always craves, or is it there a kind of blind? worship and need of power just that power word keeps coming back are they all like mini fascists many of them are because he's he he gave them permission to be lawless and that's very exciting for somebody for example like lindsey graham who was always very right wing on many issues but he was he was pro military pro american national security i wouldn't have called him like a totally lawless individual but now he is He's down for anything that his leader will do. Um, yeah. And even Bill Barr, who's now, you know, trying to re- rehabilitate his reputation, going around. Yeah. Well, Bill Barr, uh, before you mentioned Donald Trump and the police, you know, going to the police and saying, yeah, you can knock their heads. If you look at all the um, speeches that Bill Barr gave while he was attorney general for Trump to the police association, he would go around to these events. They're terrifying. They're totally fascist. He said, yeah. you're engaged in a, you know, an unceasing war against criminal predators. And when I read his speeches, I was like, this is exactly what Pinochet in Chile used to say, the same stuff. So they all signed on for their own reasons. Um, and I think, you know, and many are, have been intimidated, but somebody like Bill Barr, they, they actually share many of the same um, ambitions even if they're now going on TV trying to separate themselves from him. It's frightening, isn't it? Because he, wasn't he an AG under a previous administration as well? Yeah, yes. So it's, it, it's like this has been around for years. Yeah, and, and, and a lot of you know, these people, because they were, were very important people, and I guess they still are, they get prime time to come on and be the good person and say, oh, no, Donald Trump is lawless. You know, like, but we, we're forgetting. That's why I... I have all this documentation of Barr and others and strongmen because I had a feeling that we would need to remember. <laughs> I didn't know you what would receipts. happen. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I didn't know what would happen. But um, part of the dynamic is that you're encouraged to forget um, the all the complicity. One of the biggest fears of Trump supporters and MAGA Republicans is that the Democrats are going to turn the U.S. communist. And they, you know, they talk about this all the time. They're going to, they're the communists. They're going to make this communist. And I don't think any of them know what communism means or what it really stands for. And obviously it's complex because, you know, the the Chinese Communist Party uses the word communist as a as a distraction, doesn't it? It's not not really a communist party at all. But people don't realize that. And Trump uses the Chinese Communist Party, Marjorie Taylor Greene. They say that word as often as possible to put fear into people. Just tell us about China, kind of the misuse of the word, also misuse of uh, socialism and all, all of these kind of tropes that are designed to kind of confuse and, and frighten people. Yeah, it's really it's really um, it's really incredible again, what they have pulled off in propaganda with radical Marxism, radical left, that's the, that's the core slogan. Then they use communism, um, you know, and because uh, in some countries like Italy, Italy had, had a very large left wing. It had before 1989, the biggest communist party in Europe. It had, it still had a big left. America didn't have a big left. We don't have a big communist party. So this is just pure invention. And yet um, it works on people because it's part of polarizing them. It's either the far right, which they're calling conservative, or it's, yeah. you know, these commies. And I get emails every day uh, from people who know nothing about me, but they see me on TV or whatever, and they say, you're a radical leftist. And they repeat the exact propaganda that um, they hear on Fox and from Trump, et cetera. So there's a kind of, uh, they get rid of the nuance. 
in terms of China, this is just total BS because, you know, as we know, Trump was like propped up by loans from China. He had Elaine Chao, who was very involved with the Chinese in investments. He had his own daughter, Ivanka, who was getting Chinese trademarks uh, through 2018, and Trump was getting some too. So these people are in bed with China financially. And, and so, but this goes back to the opportunism. It just sounds good. I mean, China is, is a, a hor the Chinese government is a horrible authoritarian regime. Um, and it's, it's doing a huge amount of damage all over the world, in, in my opinion, as a scholar of authoritarianism. But they're using this in this totally um, old fashioned, you know, fascist way that you've got to have commies as your enemies in order to get people over to the right. That's the playbook. It's very interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, what I've learned of uh, American English, it's, it's very you know, literal. And, uh, and it does differ from British English, which I grew up learning, right? And, and it's, it's very literal. Like, these are eyeglasses in America, whereas I just call them glasses. And so I, I've always found that very interesting. And so when it comes to phrases like Marxism and socialism and communism, there, there is no room for nuance, and I do think that that's kind of something that, you know, it, it's not very helpful when you're dealing with an authoritarian character like Trump, who is throwing these things around. You know, people are not interested in taking the time to see how these words have evolved over the years. And in fact, I just saw the Oppenheimer movie, which half of that film is them, you know, hunting down communists in America. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it plays on McCarthyism. And so it so this is what Trump is doing. He's taking this authoritarian playbook, which has been everywhere, plus he's resurrecting um, things that are particular to America, like McCarthyism, uh, you know, the history of Jim Crow, segregation, that particular racist history. And it's all one toxic mix now. That's, that's why he's got the following he does, because there, he's got so many, he and, and by he I also mean his enablers. Um, they've got so many different constituencies um, that are, you know, part of that their uh, part of their coalition and part of their support. That it's 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 daunting. It's a daunting thing to try and reverse. There was a, an Ipsos poll out uh, done this week, actually, uh, that suggests that um, Trump, who's still the Republican front runner. Uh, that his legal woes have done little to damage his status. 47% of Republican voters said they would support him uh, after the indictment on Tuesday and the arraignment on Thursday, extending his lead over Ron DeSantis. Three quarters of Republicans said they agreed that the charges were politically motivated, showing that Trump's claim that he is the victim of political persecution resonates with his base. I mean, this is part of the problem, isn't it? That That, you know, when people are responding to a poll... You know, they're faced with their, you know, their allegiance. Democrats don't put the leader on a pedestal. You know, a Democrat will vote Democrat no matter who it is, whereas these people are very much Trump supporters, aren't they? Mm -hmm. And, and is, their allegiance is to one man. Yeah, that's why he's in my book. He's the strong man. He's, the, he's got a leader cult. And when you have that situation, nobody else can really emerge in the party. Um, now... Ron DeSantis, considering his personality, which is wooden, um, he has no charisma, and he's also trying to out-Trump Trump, which is a stupid maneuver. Yeah. He's actually, the fact he's got, you know, even a little bit of support is amazing in my book. Um, and, and, but he's, he's, he has no chance. No one can emerge. And, and indeed, what happens with these overwhelmingly dominant figures is that the system becomes kind of fossilized because it's all about them and no talent can emerge at the national level uh, unless they become a mini Trump. And, and in fascist Italy and Nazi Germany, it used to be, people used to say the mini Mussolini's, the mini Hitler's, little Hitler's. Um, so here we had Ron DeSantis was literally the Trump clone. He made himself, he even used his infant as a prop in his campaign ad where running for governor the first time when he said, 
you know, I'm a diehard Trump supporter. And he had a picture of his infant crib with a blanket that said Trump, you know, the whole thing. So he's, that's what happens. All you can do is have imitators of the big man. And ultimately that's terrible for the party. It just, they've set themselves on a course that doesn't end well um, long term. Let's talk about DeSantis just for a moment, because he, um, at an event on uh, Thursday, I think it was, he said that under his presidency, Mexican drug cartels would be shot stone cold dead. And he vowed when it comes to federal bureaucrats, he said, we are going to start slitting throats on day one. Yeah, this is... (laughs) This is, un- un- it's, I was going to say it's unbelievable. It's, it's terribly sad and terribly dangerous uh, because he, I have a piece in, um, in Lucid about him feeling he has to be the macho predator. Um, but I, I can't tell you how, given the history of authoritarianism, how uh, dangerous it is to say you're going to start slitting throats on day one. And that's, how he wants, he thinks he has to present himself to get votes from Trump. That means that the entire GOP has been converted to this kind of lawlessness. He's talking like a gangster, like a mafioso. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, Trump is, a, Trump is a mobster and, and yeah. DeSantis is a wannabe mobster. And so what happens, unfortunately, for the culture, for the nation, is that you can only get ahead if you are a mobster type person, if you will break the law. That's why we have one third of the Republican House are election deniers, because election denial, it's not just saying I'm not going to believe this fact, it's corruption. It's refusing to acknowledge a, a free and fair election. It's corruption. So, so slowly, well, they've already been compromised by his big crimes, but he's creating the circumstance for the GOP to be a party of criminals. And that's why you get DeSantis saying, thinking it's a good idea that it was, oh, we're going to slit their throats. I mean, this is, it's terrifying. And I'm not easily scared because of the yeah. people I personally, you know, I'm not scared, but it, it's, it's terrifying for us as a nation. Okay, let's take another quick break and come back with a uh, final conversation about Mike Pence, of all people. Everyone knows how annoying cheap razors are. The cuts, the irritation, the frustration. And don't get me started with subscription razor services. The headaches those can cause. That's why you've got to meet Henson Shaving. Henson Shaving is a family-owned aerospace parts manufacturer that has made parts for the International Space Station and Mars Rover. And now they're bringing precision engineering to your shaving experience. Razor blades are like diving boards. The longer the board, the more the wobble. The more wobble, the more nicks, cuts, and scrapes. A bad shave isn't a blade problem, it's an extension problem. By using aerospace-grade CNC machines, Henson makes metal razors that extend just 0.0013 inches, which is less than the thickness of a human hair. That means a secure and stable blade with a vibration-free shave. And it gets better. The razor has built-in channels to evacuate hair and cream, which makes clogging virtually impossible. Seriously, Henson Shaving wants to be the best razor, not the best razor business. That means no plastic, no subscriptions, no proprietary blades, and no planned obsolescence. The Henson razor works with standard dual-edged blades to give you that old-school shave with the benefits of new-school tech. Once you own a Henson razor, it's only about 3 to $5 per year to replace the blades. My first shave with the Henson razor was incredibly refreshing. The design is sleek, the durability is top-notch. The Henson razor is truly so much better than your run-of-the-mill, quote-unquote, traditional razor brand. And the affordability factor is absolutely game-changing. No more wasting your money on expensive blades. With Henson shaving, you can get a year of blades for $5. It's time to say no to subscriptions and yes to a razor that'll last you a lifetime. Visit hensonshaving.com slash weekend to pick the razor for you and use code weekend and you'll get two years worth of blades free with your razor. Just make sure you add them to your cart. That's 100 free blades when you head to h-e-n-s-o-n-s-h-a-v-i-n-g dot com slash weekend and use code 
weekend. Maybe you're like me and you sometimes struggle with what to wear, finding pieces that go together and the hassle maybe of changing clothes for different activities. Well, Roan's Commuter Collection is the most comfortable, breathable and flexible set of products. Commuter Collection offers the world's most comfortable clothes. You never have to worry about what to wear when you have the Roan Commuter Collection. And with Roan's wrinkle release technology, wrinkles disappear as you stretch and wear the products. With Gold Fusion anti-odor technology, you'll be smelling fresh and clean all day long. And on top of that, Roan is 100% machine washable, so you can ditch the dry cleaner all together. I personally love feeling fresh. I love a technical fabric, and that makes me kind of confident knowing that the, the clothes are looking after themselves. Well, the commuter collection can get you through any workday and straight into whatever comes next. Head to roan.com slash weekend show and use promo code weekend show to save 20% off your entire order. That's 20% off your entire order when you head to roan, R-H-O-N-E dot com slash weekend show and use code weekend show. It's time to find your corner office comfort. We're back with Ruth ben Gatt. Um People now off the back of Trump's arrest and arraignment have started to kind of be a little bit more explicit, including former Vice President Mike Pence, who was interviewed in a kind of ad hoc way and basically said that Trump told him to overturn the election and he refused and he chose the Constitution over one man. And he said anybody who puts themselves above the Constitution is does not deserve to be the president either in the past or in the future and i was like wow mike pence like where have you been for the last five years is it the case do you think that people have read this 47 page indictment they've seen how damning the evidence is how clever jack smith has been in you know in in making these charges about things that really can't be challenged and that maybe more Mike Pence's are going to come forward now and, and turn on their supreme leader? I'm not sure that that's going to happen. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it's very telling that Mike Pence waited. I mean, he's running for president against Trump. So yeah. it's very that. But actually, given that fact, it's all the more interesting that he didn't come out and and say these things as explicitly before, because he's had a lot of, you know, one on one in-depth media interviews. And I've been waiting for him to, you know, because to tell this, the story of what happened to him, which he, he could destroy Trump in a minute, and he could, always could have. In fact, yeah. the sad thing for me, who, as, from the point of view of studying, what does it take to stop these people? On January 7th, had he come forth and decided to lead the Republican Party because you had Mitch McConnell saying, hey, we can't, this is like way too much. You had various people um, who were so scared, they had all just had their, they had run for their lives. So Mike Pence could have come forth and led uh, an anti-Trump, uh, you know, kind of contingent, and then uh, he would have been toast. He would never have been a candidate now. But he was too cowardly or whatever his problem was to, to, to do that, and he stayed silent for years. And he refused to, I think, at the beginning, testify to the January 6th committee. He was a, he would not cooperate. Um, That's right. Yeah, he re rejected the subpoena initially as well. But yes. Bill Barr is another one. Bill Barr is somebody that knew about the coup and decided to leave two weeks before the coup happened yes. through the back door. Yes. I mean, and now he's on his, on his tour of TV studios. Yeah, now he's the, bit, now he's the person. He's, yes, the, this is the... This is scrambling for the exit, but but very yeah. few people. What what Pence's behavior has told people is that you, you you shouldn't do that. That even Pence isn't doing that, even though he's running for president. And in fact, um, they've all been cowardly, like tiptoeing around, even though they're all meaning all of those who are running for president against him. That's the time that you take the gloves off normally, and nobody's doing it. And they just, they fear him. They fear they're going to get, um, you know, that'll be the end of their campaign. Um, 
he still wields so much power, even despite all of these charges. Because don't forget, there's also the the stolen documents case. We've got Forney Willis and and Georgia. The, you know, and this is what's so clever about this. Do you do you think, just finally, like a prediction wise, you know, with all of these different cases in different jurisdictions in in Florida and D.C. and Georgia. Do you think that this house of cards is going to topple? You know, will there ever come a point where Trump will go quietly, whether it be in handcuffs or just skulking back to Mar-a-Lago and, and, and the whole presidency will be over or the, the bid for presidency? Or will he just run from a prison cell and, and, you know, that's what America's new chapter will look like? Yes, he will never, ever retreat. He will never surrender. Um, because his everything he's built so far would be in vain. Um, he would become irrelevant if he's not running. And also the main thing is that the playbook is the more legal troubles you have, the more you've got to get back into power to shut it all down. Um, that's yeah. what Netanyahu, is, who has three indictments against him, and he got back into power and he immediately tries to uh, have, quote, judicial reform. And so they that's want right. what they want <laughs> is to take away the independence of the judiciary so that all of their troubles will go away. And so Trump, Trump he, will, he will not back down um, at all. And he loves Bibi, or talks about him all the time. And, yeah. and, and America is a supporter of, of the Netanyahu regime and Israel. Yeah, and now it's interesting, given that, that two former U.S. ambassadors to Israel have called for a reevaluation of not just the relationship, but the money that's being yeah. given as well. So we shall okay. see. <laughs> well, let's talk again, because the next few months are going to be very interesting. Um, and, you know, this, this legal case, how it play, or legal cases, how they play out is going to be compelling viewing, I'm sure, for you as much as the rest of us. Ruth, just tell us finally where people can get your newsletter. It's at uh, it's a Substack newsletter, so it's lucid.substack.com, and it's um, essays twice a week. And if you become a paying subscriber, I have these weekly uh, live Q and A's, which are very popular, where I answer questions and we have great discussions. Amazing. Ruth ben Giat, thank you for joining us. I'm Anthony Davis. Don't forget to support me at patreon.com slash five minute news and download the daily five minute news podcast, which drops every morning. Join me next week with a brand new special guest and more factual news stories to discuss on the five minute news weekend show with Midas Touch. Midas Touch.